Blog Talk Radio. Our sponsor for Aviation Month at Savvy Central Radio is Winty. Winty is an aviation themed t shirt business designing and printing aviation related graphics for pilots, aviation businesses, and aviation enthusiasts worldwide. Using DPG direct to garment printing technology, Winty can print one or 100 plus garments upon request within a reasonably low turnout time, including customer submitted graphics. Contact Winty Aviation T shirt art by visiting winty.com today in order to find out how a custom aviation graphic can be printed for you. Brian, thanks for coming on and speaking to our listeners. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. I love being on Savvy Central Radio. This is my first time. I'm really excited. Oh, thank you, Brian. Well, we're happy to have you on as well, and I'd love if you could tell the listeners a little bit about your journey. You have a fascinating story on how you got intrigued and, and you know, brought into aviation and then how you started your company, Winty.com. Can you tell us a little, a little bit about your journey? I'm just going to have to uh, begin at the beginning, as corny as that sounds. I have to go way back since I was a child. Winty, in the beginning, wasn't my initial goal, but it was an evolution of my childhood passion of becoming a, an airline pilot. And as far as I can remember, my grandma used to say that I, as young as age three, I've had this ambition to want to fly. And uh, in, those, in those days, this was the 1970s and uh, the tail end of the glory years of airline travel when people used to dress up and guys wore suit jackets, women wore dresses and high heels and hats. And I even saw a, a few of the old school travelers with the white gloves. And my mm-hmm. mom came from that group and so did my grandma. Flying was a was an adventure. I mean, you'd, we'd go out to Kennedy and I, I'd see the travelers there. Everybody was excited and there was this energy of like, we're going traveling, we're going to see this new place. And in the midst of all that, I'd see the airline pilots walk back and forth through the terminals, going to their airplanes with their flight crew and the flight attendants. And I don't know, I, I, the visual was just so overwhelming. I admired those men who wore those pilot suits with the stripes on their sleeves and the hats. They looked so professional and so cool. They looked very confident, like they really knew what they were doing, and also the jets that I could see outside the terminal windows, and that made mm-hmm. a real big impression on me. And I, I've always pretty much known what I wanted to do, and that's what my, my goal was. I said, well, when I grow up, I want to be an airline pilot. Mm-hmm. And uh, over the years, and you know, flying on the planes, I've had the privilege of going into the flight deck. Back in those days, the flight attendants, if you just placed a request and said, you know, could I just go up to the front and you know, see the, the cockpit and they would just grab my hand and they would take me to the door and I'd see what a lot of people say, all the clocks and the instruments and everything was like lit up. It was like Christmas times 10, you know? Yeah. And it was like, wow, I see these guys sitting there. And that's when they had the flight engineers too. So it wasn't just the captain and the first officer. He had the flight engineer with his panel and that thing was lit up and I was like, oh, wow. And I was six years old just drooling there at, at the entrance of the doorway and they take me back to my seat so years after that I just had my head in the sky and trying to identify planes and the opportunities when I used to go flying and taking trips I'd memorize the cards in the back of the seat and say this is a 707 this is 747 DC-9 MD-80 and all of that. And it's cool. And, you know, remember when we used to be able to go out and watch on the tarmac or at least close to the window and watch all the airplanes before they used to put barbed wire around all the airports? <laughs> I know. I wonder whose brilliant idea was that to put barbed wire on. And, and even even some terminals nowadays, you can't even look outside the window. I mean, you go inside this big room, you can't even mm-hmm. see out. I mean, it's just chairs and it's like a holding cell. I mean, I'm really, really privileged to, to have said that I've experienced that time and even my parents used to tell me back in the days when Kennedy was called Idlewild and the time of the Beatles and even in the 60s. And I don't know if it's still there, but visitors could go outside on the roof. Mm. And they had a rail there. And even though you weren't a traveler, you can stand on that roof. And I'm sure many people listening now who who've visited Idlewild in the early years of, of Kennedy Airport used to be able to go out on that and view the airplanes taxiing in and going out. But now that's all closed off. You know, and 
if you can remember, like when the Beatles, the, the Beatle invasion, you can see all the screaming young girls. They're on top of that, that observation deck. You know? Ah, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's closed, and uh, that's a time that I'll never return. But um, So, yeah, I was enamored with and fascinated with that, and that's what led me to want to become a pilot. And Fortunately for me, um, I've had, and I still do, I have uh, two family members who were in the Air Force, but they were enlisted, and they gave me guidance when I was a little boy, and they said that after high school, you go to college and college, become an officer, you'll be a lieutenant, and he says, if you want to go in the military and you want to fly airplanes, that's the way to do it. These mm -hmm. guys, they were sergeants. My uh, uncle uh, used to jump out of airplanes. He was a skydiver, mm -hmm. so uh, they, they gave me good advice, and for me, over the years, I, I was able, in my interest, you know, search and research and read books. My mom worked in the library, so I would just go through the airline books and jewel over the pictures and like that's what I'm going to be that's what I'm going to be not that's what I want to be but that's what I'm going to be mm -hmm. I remember and, you uh, even mentioning to me prior to the interview that you used to you know your grandma used to tell you you'd run around with your arms spread open as if you were an airplane yourself oh yeah well actually that was uh, we flew to Puerto Rico one summer and my mom my dad and my brother we found an airport uh, not too far away from the ocean and uh, it was a military base and actually I have that on film on mm. 8 millimeter film before VA HS and DVDs and stuff. I have my arms spread out and I'm like running on the grass and then I throw myself to the floor trying to make a landing <laughs> in, in front of this string of big lights. I mean, back then I didn't know what it was, but now I know what it is. It's They were the approach lights, the lead-in lights to the runway for instrument flying. But uh, you see me on film, 8 millimeter film, silent vi uh, film, running around with my arms and throwing myself to the ground like landing as an airplane. So I was just slightly obsessed. Slightly, slightly. slightly. So <laughs> as you went through your childhood and your teenage years and you had that focus towards working in aviation, what was your main goal for working in aviation? You wanted to be a pilot for the majors or you wanted to be a CFI? What, what was your particular focus? As much as I loved airline flying, or at least the illusion of airline flying, mm -hmm. uh, because I know, you know pilots today, especially professional pilots, they're going through the struggles of downsizing and the curse of the managers in the suits who are basically running these beautiful legacy airlines mm -hmm. into the ground and ruining a uh, beautiful profession. But uh, I won't go off on that. I wanted to be an airline pilot, but as I was growing up, I had a fascination and love for military aviation. And I had this somewhat of a romantic feeling for the Air Force because the Air Force was the Army Air Corps, the World War II and the Berlin Airlift and all of the, and the, and the Doolittle Raiders. I mean, the United States Air Force has such a rich history mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a part of that. And I said, well, I'm going to high school, graduate from college, become a uh, second lieutenant and fly jets. And at that time, I wanted to fly the F-15, and I said, well, I'll do my 10, 11 years as a fighter pilot. After that, join the airlines, and then retire, and then maybe go corporate after that, because of the, the limitations on airline pilots back then was age 60, now it's 65. But as far as I understand today, there is no limitation on corporate pilots. So I could have a threefold career, military, airline, and then corporate. So I could have experience mm. the entire spectrum that's how it went down that's yeah. at least that was the plan you know? yeah so I, I know you had mentioned prior that you um, did serve in, in high school in ROTC correct uh, that was in college college um, yeah I in my first year of college I was in the Air Force ROTC program and uh, you want to tell listeners a little bit about what that is some people might not know what that is actually there's three ways of getting into the military as far as becoming an officer there's officer candidate school OCS Mm -hmm. or OTS. Um, with the Air Force, it's OTS, Officer Training School. I think that's what it's called. And after college, as a civilian, you go to a recruiter and they'll guide you in and they'll get you into OTS. And I think it's eight weeks or two months or three months of uh, intense military indoctrination. And once you graduate from that, you become a second lieutenant or a second Louis or the golden bars or butter bars that you get to wear when you get out. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is Air Force ROTC. You go in as a civilian into a college of your choice that has that program. Mm -hmm. And for four years, you're steadily being indoctrinated as a military officer and a leader. So that was the, the path that I chose. And the other one, which I think is arguably the most glamorous, is go into the Air Force Academy. So after high school with good grades and a, and a great SAT score and a recommendation from your congressman or senator, you go into the Air Force Academy. And then from there, four years of that, and then you become a second lieutenant. 
that was the that was the thing. I had it all mapped out. That, that was your vision. Yeah. Vision. So so tell us what happened as you were getting closer to vision. You are, you were you are in R R O T C and and then what happened? Well, unfortunately for me in my case, I was stricken with an illness that affected my digestive system, and it had a secondary problem that came with it. A severe arthritic condition in my joints. So basically, um, as I'm talking to you right now, my my spine from the base of my neck to my hips are fused. That obviously knocked out the opportunity of going into the military. Mm -hmm. Before the illness was fully manifested, in high school, I was fortunate enough to go to a vocational high school. And in that school, there was the aviation program. And we had sponsors who paid for our flight training. We'd go out to Republic Airport on Long Island, FRG. If you guys want to look it up, it's FRG, Foxtrot Romeo Golf. And every Friday, the high school students of this aviation program would go out there and have flight training. We'd go up in 152s. We'd go up in 172s. But back in the school in Manhattan, where the school was, we'd have ground training. So we call it ground flight, but it was actually ground school. Mm -hmm. And we were learning aeronautics and weather and the science of becoming a pilot. But in addition to that, we had special courses structured around what was like a major. Of course, in high school, well, at least in our high school, we don't have majors. You just go to school and you accumulate credits and then you graduate. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate to have a navigation class, which was taught by a math teacher, a math professional. And mm -hmm. we learned navigation for private pilot. But we went further, above and beyond the typical. Mm -hmm. We learned the flight computer, the E6B, and working the wind side, for those of us who know about the E6B computer, there's a wind side. We learned flight computing and wind vectors, the mathematical and the trigonometric way. We mm -hmm. draw on a sheet of paper line vectors where it was the wind direction and then the ground speed and then the resultant vector of those two forces gave us our ground track, our ground speed and heading and things like that. I mean, it was really intense. It helped us to understand, really understand and to know what was going on when we were navigating. So in addition to that, we had a semester of aviation weather and our school teacher taught us, I mean, a full semester of real weather. Mm -hmm. We learned about temperature and dew point spreads, cloud calculating cloud bases and visibility, understanding weather trends, fronts, pressure systems, and different things like that. And I mean, it was amazing. We all, It was a really good program. And for free, I mean, it was, this is was public high school. Awesome. Totally awesome. So now that you've gone through this program in high school and then you entered into college and was in ROTC, was that the time frame in which you got Got struck with this illness at that time? I need to add in a little something just before that. Okay. During high school, every once in a while during the summertime, I'd get additional flight training, paid flight training. I'd go out to the airport and out of my own pocket, I'd pay for flight training in addition to the flying that I was already doing in high school. I didn't get my private pilot's license when I got out of high school. So going into college is when I did my first solo and I was doing more of the advanced stuff and I was doing the, the solo flying. I had to come back to New York because I went to St. Louis to learn out there and continue my education here in New York City and it was here is where I finished my private pilot training I got my instrument multi-engine and commercial so I did that here locally but I didn't do that in college during that time of, of training the illness started to manifest itself long, to make a long story short was that I was diagnosed my outlook on my goal was changed mm. it was it was a big blow it was for those of us who know who love flying I mean, an illness or a tragedy or, or, or money or something in somebody's life to, to take you away from something that you really love, is, it's, it's, it really hurts. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Do you mind telling the audience what, what it is that you have? Without giving too much detail, I just want to say it's a gastrointestinal disorder that affects my digestion. On the surface, what's visible is the the arthritis. They call it ankylosing spondylitis. It's a severe form of arthritis, which basically attacks all of your joints. But at least in my case, it's most pronounced in my back and in mm. my neck. But I do at least have some articulation near the waist. Mm. And that's what's going to lead to um, a another part in my, my journey. Because um, when that was happening, I had to stop work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been very fortunate enough and blessed 
to have parents who took care of me during that transition. I mean, because if I didn't have their help, I don't, I don't know what I would have done during this, this difficult time. And while I was on my back lying in bed, just being tired of being tired and sick and tired of being sick and tired, I was like, you know what? I, I got to do something with myself. I mean, I've got the certificates. I have this ability to draw. I'm an artist because ever since I've been a child, I've been drawing things. Mm-hmm. And why not make a business to at least highlight my aviation and practice art at the same time? Mm -hmm. I drew up a a small business plan and a vision, which is now Winty. At first, I didn't know how to really do it. I just said to myself, just put it on paper, get it organized, get the thoughts that you have in your mind. It's well organized. Just put it on paper and see if I can get investments, you know, in order to help me do that. Mm -hmm. My parents, as, as beautiful as they are, they helped invest in my business and they fronted the money. The part that was difficult, and I know you were probably going to ask me later on in the interview, mm-hmm. uh, some of the struggles that I had, so I might as well just jump into that now. It was execution. I, mm-hmm. I knew what I wanted. I already had the vision of Winty, but how do I execute it? And I'm sure that's a problem with a lot of small business owners oh, yeah. is that they have fantastic businesses. And Christina, you know, too, with your business, we have fantastic ideas as entrepreneurs. But how do I make it a reality? So I was wondering, should I outsource my work? Meaning, do I do all the graphics at home and have a screen printer do the images and then sell and distribute that way through a website? Mm-hmm. Not sure of the quality of the screen printers or the turnaround time or the responsibility I wasn't pleased with what I saw. And, and in fact, Christina, you got to see some of the early samples of the screen printers that I got. Yeah. I was like, you know what? This is not going to work this way. There has to be another way. I didn't want to buy my own screen printing equipment because any screen printers out there listening do know how much of a headache it is to run a screen printing business. I mean, you have the equipment, the screens, the inks, the squeegees, the spraying, the preparations of the screens, the exposures, the color separations. I mean, it's like not just a job, it's a workout. And, you know, I mean, I didn't want to go through that, especially the way my body was feeling. But fortunately for me, I discovered direct-to-garment printing, DTG. And I said, you know what? If I get my own printers, this way I can directly from the computer put these digital images on fabric and distribute it that way for lower cost. Hmm. So that's how Winty was born. I bought my first printer about four years ago and I started the images. I built the website myself because I had to do everything pretty much on a shoestring budget with the limited funds I had. And uh, I went to lynda.com. That's a fantastic website. Anybody out there who's interested in website design and development and graphic design and art, go to lynda.com because they really do. L-Y-N-D-A.com. That's where I learned to to build a website. So the website you see now, Winty, I, I designed and built that myself. I now have an interface and people from around the world, I've sold Winties to, off the top of my head, I guess, almost 20 countries around the world, including Russia, Israel, Australia keeps, keeps coming up multiple times, the UK, Greece, this, uh, it's just all over the place, many That's states fantastic. in the United States and Canada, lot, lots of them in Canada, of course. That's fantastic. Can you tell the listeners, you were just mentioning struggles before, how did you get your business moving? Because now you're in a six-figure range. How did you finally get off and take off? Because I know a lot of small businesses get started and like myself, thought, hey, people are just going to be banging my doors down for my product, and that's not the case. So how did you really get going? How did it happen for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that is not the case. I mean, you can have the greatest invention that the world has been seeking for centuries. And if nobody knows about it, you can just forget about it. (laughs) So that's how it was. I mean, I didn't know how to market myself. So I had to do it like on the cheap, meaning like like a Facebook or Twitter thing and try to do the word of mouth at the airport and see if I can make connections and do it that way. But uh, the first year was very difficult. It was very slow. And uh, fortunate for me, I found an aviation magazine, a startup aviation magazine, and I was advertising through AOPA on the, the back pages. And one of the, um, the founders of the magazine contacted me to make 600 prints for these people front and back for their launch. And, you know, one thing started from there. But the real big kicker was somebody in the garment industry midtown manhattan was Mm -hmm. looking for a direct-to-garment printer and this is the thing where having contacts and maintaining a business relationship with your vendors and people you meet is very important because that next person you meet can be a multi-million dollar deal basically overnight Mm -hmm. 
So uh, that's what happened to me. Not the million dollar part yet. Yet. <laughs> Not yet. But uh, I'm on my way. They, this particular high profile graphics broker contacted the manufacturer or I should say the distributor of the equipment I bought. And they said, hey, we need to look for a DTG printer. Are you interested? So I basically auditioned with a sample of one of their samples and I was hired. What this, the way this works is they are licensees and they have licenses to, high, to popular graphics like Nintendo, um, Mario Brothers, uh, Sonic. Yeah, Sonic and Sega and all, uh, video games and even movies like say like the Chipmunks one time when, when it came out. The, the owners of these images and of these movies, oh, Disney and Pixar, all those people, they sell licenses to this broker and they develop the images to however which way they want it, but there's, a, there's an approval process. So what happens is that the graphics in their, in their stash or in their cache, the graphic designers make a t-shirt image and they sent me the graphics they send me the shirts and i print out the samples however many they need and i send them back via messenger or fedex and it gets either approved or it gets denied and i make an, uh, a change and i reprint it for them again then it goes out in the market and then it gets multiplied 100,000 200,000 half a million copies going through stores like target and walmart and sears and these major distributors mm. I mean, it's, it's a multi-million dollar business. So that's and, where it starts, eh? <laughs> and that's how it started. I mean, it basically fell in my lap, you know? They came to me, and I was like, wow. And that's how Winty all of a sudden it started to go big time. I bought two more printers. It's, it has grown. I've, I've hired part-time help. I've had people help me, and I've, I've gone. And it's, it's been a real amazing trip. Well, you know, you made, you made a very important point before when you said to keep your lines of communications and relationships open because the next person you meet could be your next big deal to launch your business into big time. But you've got to be open to that and continually build those relationships. So that, that's some good advice out there for people. Yes, keep those contacts open. Don't burn any bridges, as, as, as tacky as these cliches may sound. I mean, really, be on the lookout for an opportunity. Be opportunity-minded. You know, mm-hmm. if don't walk around with your brain in your pockets, I mean, be out there looking for opportunities because that next person you might meet might be the one that could send you to the next level. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, I'm wondering as you've gone through this amazing journey, you know, even being struck with that awful illness that you still continue to be able to fly as a general aviation pilot, which I think is amazing. Uh, you worked all the way up to commercial and, uh, I've flown with you many times. You're a phenomenal instrument and private pilot. You're, I feel totally safe with you. Um, but among that, then starting this business and building it to where it is today, I'm, I'm really hats off. And I, I'm wondering, you know, who have been some of the role models who have inspired you on, on your journey? and pushed Okay, you before, bef- before I answer that question, let me just camp out on the flying part again. Okay. Being that I'm enjoying the success that I'm enjoying now with the, the graphics and Winty being able to make copies. And I've been able to go flying and I, f- I found a really cool flying club and flying school on Long Island. They're, they're well known. I f- rent their airplanes and I was able to, for the very first time, and, and every pilot knows this, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I've been in aviation now, or at least I, I've been a licensed pilot now for over 22 years. A good portion of that was not flying due to the illness. But m- recently, within the past year and a half, uh, I was, I've been able to get a medical. And uh, that was like a big hurdle. That was another thing, too. I, I just want to touch on it really quickly oh, because it. it's all part of Winty. Last year during AOPA Summit, I'm really fortunate for AOPA and, and the work they do and the, the resources they provide. I went to a, a medical sit-in and there was a board of doctors and on that board, I think it was an Australian or an English doctor on AOPA, he's one of their contributors. He was there with two other doctors along with a, uh, a NASA doctor who uh, signs off basically pilots to go into space. Mm-hmm. After I had a conversation with them, I wanted to know what were my chances because I just didn't want to go and get a medical and then have it denied because I was considering the light sport movement. So uh, he said, well, I spoke to you. I, I'm looking at you now. If you come down to where I'm at, I'll, I'll check you out and I'll, I'll get you the medical. My confidence shot through the roof like a thousand times. Wow, there is really an opportunity that I can do it. I have to give a shout out to, to Gary Crump of AOPA also. He is in charge of medical certification in AOPA. He gave me a name to a name of a doctor here in this area, in the tri-state area. 
I got to see the uh, doctor who interviewed me for about a half an hour and along with the local FISDO, the local FAA airman doctor, I don't know what the exact title is, but he says, I can give you medical right now. So we filled out the paperwork and I passed, I got a third class. Yay. And uh, you, Christina, you went with me that day. Yeah, I was uh, very happy yeah. for you. We went to the airport and I was like smiling from ear to ear. I was yeah, like, Yeah, I said, let's wow. just go to the FBO and get you an airport right now. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it. You were so excited. It's like, I just walked down and it's like, where's there an... Get an instructor here ASAP. Let's get up there and get checked out. Let's get out. checked out right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was really cool. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling right now just thinking about what happened about a year and a half ago. And that was in October. So uh, I was like, I'm not wasting any time. I'm going to my, my nest, going to Republic. I'm going to get checked out and get back in the air again. And it's been a wonderful trip since then. It's been now um, over a year. I've logged over 153 hours within the past 12 months. Wow. And uh, the big highlight of that has been Oshkosh. It was something that I've wanted to do ever since I knew it existed. So I rented a, an airplane. In fact, I rented the uh, AOPA Sweepstakes 2008 Good as Glass Archer 2. <laughs> yeah. And I flew that puppy from Republic all the way to Oshkosh. Flew you over, go. <laughs> over uh, Lake Michigan. Um, we had our vests on, of course, for all you safety nuts out there. I had my life vests on. I stayed in contact with ATC. And what was cool was that uh, I logged so much IMC going there. I mean, that airplane was like an instrument pilot's dream. It was got the Avidyne glass panel that had ADSB and XM weather and stuff like that. And it was fun. It was great. Awesome. Awesome. I know some of the words you're dropping. Some, some of the other listeners might not know what that is, but IMC is basically where you have to look at your gauges, guys, and you, you don't have any references outside the window. So he was a total instrument pilot uh, all the way to Oshkosh, I believe, was, you know, kind of crummy weather, right? Right. We Since we couldn't do it nonstop, we departed Republic to, I think it was Buffalo. Yeah, but it was Buffalo. We landed in Buffalo, and it was IMC. It was instrument meteorological conditions all the way up there. And then from there, we flew through Canada, which was nice, in the middle of the night. In IMC, I mean, it was pitch dark. I mean, it was like farmland with thunderstorms to the north and thunderstorms to the south and flying that airplane with strike finder aboard. I mean, you could see the lightning strikes. I mean, we were in a, in a really nice channel that we got to fly through with convection to the north and to the south, you know, knowing how it is in the summertime. Mm -hmm. We landed in uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I think like 3 o'clock in the morning. I uh, had to shoot an instrument approach with mist. And it was not quite low IFR, but um, it was a little bit of a challenge getting in there. But it was fun. It was a big airport. Landed, stayed overnight. And the next day, I mean, pilot dream. I mean, it was a sunny sky, blue, clear, bright. It was warm. We, we went out to the airplane. We put on our life vests. Um, we called our contact in Wisconsin, tell them we're coming over. We're flying over Lake Michigan. We should be there in like about an hour and a half. And uh, I got to do the uh, Fisk arrival. It was on a Friday. It wasn't nutty. I didn't come in like in the mad rush. It was my <laughs> first time getting in. I didn't want to get hurt. So uh, Christina was there with me. We even videotaped it. And it was really cool. I mean, Fisk, airplane over Fisk, rock your wings. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. Landing it on the green dot. Mm -hmm. and went to parking and just had an amazing 10 days in Wisconsin. Well, a lot of the listeners might not be familiar with Oshkosh, but everyone do go out on YouTube, check out um, Air Venture Oshkosh, and you'll see what we're talking about here. It's really, especially on the nutty days when you have like a, you know, a billion planes coming in at once, it's really challenging and, and it's very interesting. And, uh, yeah, I did go with Brian on that trip. It was phenomenal, a, a wonderful week of flying. I call it airplane heaven because it's, it is airplane hunting. Yeah, it's a nonstop airplane flying. It's, it's completely amazing. If you love airplane, it's the place to be. Um, yes. it, it's totally awesome. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. It was fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm considering going to Sun and Fun next year, so I'm still on this high of me getting my medical and getting back into the air. So Sun and Fun uh, 2013 is in the crosshairs. It's in the flight plan. Awesome. Awesome. So as you've gone through this, you know, whole journey, and it's been an amazing journey, Brian, have you had any, anyone in particular that inspired you and propelled you forward in, in your business and in life? Well, it's not just one particular person, but I, I, I don't want to sound overconfident or cocky here, but I have to say myself first, because uh, I'm a personal inspiration. I mean, the struggles that I've gone through and still dealing with, I mean, I'm still dealing with the illness, but I'm not letting it knock me down. And uh, if I can persevere through that, you know, somebody who's in good health, you know, we all have our own obstacles, but the ones who win are the ones who never let themselves get knocked out. You get knocked down, 
but don't get knocked out. Just keep it going, keep your eyes on the prize, and keep it moving forward. That's, I have to put myself first with that. That's phenomenal. But, I like that you said that because not too many people give themselves props, and you have gone through a lot. And, and like Michael Combs, who came before you in our first episode, he also dealt with a lot of challenging um, health issues and persevered to um, success. And that was his number one thing is never give up and, and go for your dream. So, I mean, that's phenomenal, Brian. So, well, who, now, go on. now that you brought up Michael's name, um, I also have to give him credit for – my inspiration as well because as you know his story he had a a heart problem and he's now flown into every single state of the union including Hawaii and uh, he did it all in a light sport airplane I mean I don't know how he did this guy's amazing and uh, I got to meet him in Oshkosh it it was a little bit of an uh, an emotional moment there but uh, Mm -hmm. I was really inspired by his testimony and what he did And uh, Michael, if you're listening out there, thanks, buddy. I mean, you've been an inspiration. Thanks so much. And and, and I'm sure you're an inspiration to many other people, too, as well. So in addition to Michael, I'm just going to add some other people because it's not just, you know, one person. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically a group of people. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard of these names. Jeff Bezos of Amazon, uh, Mark Cuban, who owns the Dallas Mavericks, Barbara Corcoran, who's a real estate mogul here in New York City, Tony Robbins, Robert Herjavec, one of the, uh, the Shark Tank members. And the reason why I'm naming these people, these people were not born wealthy. Mm -hmm. These are everyday people like you and me who had the entrepreneurial spirit that never give up. Defeat is not an option. And Michael, I mean, Jeff Bezos, for one, who started in his garage, now worth more than $23 billion. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. Owner of Amazon. Mark Cuban, who who started, I think it's an, an internet or radio business and he's worth over four billion dollars and he holds the record of the highest purchase internet purchase i think he bought a gulfstream 5 for 45 million bucks on the internet (laughs) i mean he owns the dallas uh, mavericks and then barbara corcoran who who started with a thousand dollars in the 70s and now has a billion dollar real estate enterprise here in new york city well known Mm. and it's people like this i mean tony robbins you know washing dishes in his tub Robert Herjavec, who was a, an immigrant, I mean, wasn't even born in the United States. He was born in Croatia, wow. and he's a multi-billionaire here in the United States. I mean, a really nice guy. I've never met him before. But it's people like this who give me the fire and say, you know what? If you started from nothing and you are who you are today, there has to be something special about you. And those are the people who motivate me. And you know what impresses me is that often people go straight for the millionaire and say this person and that person. Every single person you named on your list is a billionaire. And yeah, you- a billionaire. A billionaire, and soon With a Brian. B. Bravo, bravo, and soon the, the Winty Brian and Winty will soon be joining the ranks. <laughs> right, soon. So look out for Winty, because Winty is a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> That's awesome, awesome. So uh, as you've gone through this amazing journey, can you tell us or highlight some of the greatest accomplishments you've had in your personal life and in your business? I think I mentioned some of them, but just to recap on them, I would have to say Winty is one because this is basically my first really big well it's a relative word but it's a big venture that has become profitable and uh, four years working with Winty it is growing I'm still entertaining the the possibility of getting more equipment even moving to a larger location but also I'm considering branching off into other business ventures with Winty being the parent company but uh it's really exciting. It's it's within aviation, but I won't discuss that now on the air. But uh, Winty is not just going to be T-shirts. It's going to be a Winty brand name as a parent company with aviation-related subjects in addition to the T-shirts. Hmm. I really look forward to those other ventures and hearing about them in the future. Yeah. So but, you know. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was just finishing up that question there about some of the greatest successes. In addition to Winty, I would have to say, uh, many years ago, I, I used to go to a summer camp up in Brant Lake, and uh, it's amazing. Like when children have certain experiences in their life, how it can change the course of your direction. You know, you've seen these these time travel movies where you see a person who's down in the street, they're eating food out of a garbage can, and had I only hit that home run when I was in Little League, you know, where would I be? And then the movie would go back to that person and standing at the plate and crack and the wall goes over the fence and their life has changed. 
you know, and they become this amazing person that they intended to be in the first place. Mm. But uh, it's, it's very important growing up as a child to expose yourself to as many positive experiences, but also to not just be exposed to them, but to glean and to learn about those experiences. And what I'm trying to say is, is that um, at this Brant Lake camp, summer camp, every year the campers, at least the older campers, were granted the chance to swim across the lake which was about, I think, about a third of a mile across. And at age 15 or even 14, it seems like you're swimming all across an ocean because it was, it was just way wide. And I tried swimming that across, I think, twice before, and I failed mm. on uh, previous uh, camping excursions two years prior. And the last year, because the oldest age was age 15, I said, you know what, I'm not leaving this campsite. I'm not going on until I swim across this lake. And uh, that was my mission. And even before I went to the camp, I said, I'm going to camp. I'm going to swim Brent Lake. Mm. So I opted to jump out of the rowboat on the other side of the lake, not the campsite, but on the other side of the lake, because I've, I jumped initially from the, the boathouse on the campsite, and that didn't work. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go in the rowboat out with the crew and the rest of the guys and jump out the end of the lake on the other side and swim to the boathouse. Well, let me tell you something. I jumped into that lake with that water over 100 feet deep and the temperature that was in that water, this is in the middle of, in, in August, and I'm swimming and I'm swimming and I'm getting tired, going across, looking at that boathouse. With that boathouse, the focus, not looking anywhere else, not looking at the sky, not looking at the hills or the mountains, but that boathouse saying to myself, I'm going to get that boathouse. And I'm swimming and it seemed like it, wasn't never, it was never getting closer. But then I'd flip on my back and then do the backstroke, float a little bit, rest, swim forward take it easy, you know, sh tread water a little bit, and then inch my way up closer and closer to the boathouse, and it would get bigger and bigger. And I can hear the counselors in the rowboats, you can do it, you can do it, take it easy, if you need a rest, stop, take a break. Meaning, not grab onto the boat, I mean stay on the water, because if I touch the boat, it would mm. disqualify me. So I was like, I'm not leaving this camp until I win. I'm like halfway through the camp, halfway through the uh, lake, I'm exhausted. And I'm just keeping my eye on that boathouse, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, keep swimming, go on my back. Do the backstroke a little bit closer. Take a look. Where's the boathouse? There it is. Keep going. And, you know, you f you're fighting and you're struggling. It says, I'm not going to make it. And I'm like, don't say you're not going to make it. You're going to make it. It's getting bigger and bigger. And as I'm struggling and fighting, I mean, it's a psychological game, you know? Mm. I mean, you're fighting with yourself. It wasn't so much the water. I mean, I knew how to swim. You know, I've, I've, I've swum for years. I've swum in the ocean. I've swum in the pool. I was formally trained by professional swimmers. I mean, I never was in a, in a, uh, on a swim team, but I knew how to swim. But my mind kept saying, you know, you got to give up because it's just too much. It's overwhelming. But I was like, no. I kept overcoming that and looking at the boathouse getting bigger and bigger until when the boathouse got so big, about, I think it was about 200 feet away, and my muscles felt like rubber and I wanted to just collapse and, and, and gasp for air. I was like, I could do it. This is mine. And I would feel that second wind and I had like more energy and I kept swimming and swimming. I said, I'm not going to stop until I get to the dock. And until I reached that dock, I was, oh, the prize. I had the prize. I could feel the sand under my feet. I was so weak. I could not even pull myself up on a four-foot-high dock. I was like, I need to take a break. Let me just rest right here. I made it. And I, I was a new person. I'm wow. telling you, I was a new person there. Never say to yourself, can't, because can't is an evil word. It is. If you say it, it really disables you right at the gate. Never say, I can't. Say if you cannot or you're not sure, says, how can I do it? Great. What do I need to do to get to where I need to, de to be? Never entertain the word I can't. Yeah, I love that. It's like switching it from I can't to how can I. I love that. And just that simple switch will change your mindset. And you know what? That seems to be the evolution of your entire life, Brian, that in, in that it's been one difficult challenge after another, um, even getting your private pilot license and working your way all the way up to commercial is a feat on itself, um, upon itself, and then having to deal with the illness and starting the company. Um, all of that is a testament to your sticking with, I'm not going, I'm going to keep looking at the prize. And that is like wonderful, wonderful advice to anyone out there, you know, never stop fighting and, and then you mentioned also that our biggest thing that gets in the way is our mindset. Our mind saying, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Our constant negative chatter that go on. And it's interesting you mentioned this whole story because I'm putting on with a group of five other speakers the small business 
the New York Small Business Symposium too, and it'll be focused on the subject of money mindset. Because all all businesses have to make money. You're not making money, you're not in business. Right. So um, the bottom line is what gets in people's head that stops them from doing well in business is their mindset. To, you know, you'll get started in business, you don't have that door banging down with clients. You immediately think, well, what's wrong with me? You start beating yourself up. You don't do the proper things to get things moving in your company. And it's not going to be overnight. Rome wasn't built overnight. It's going to be like you in that in that uh, lake, bit by bit by bit, you know, but not giving up when you see the prize that it's, it's there. You just got to keep going. Yeah, you, gotta, you have to stay focused and you have to believe in your dream, in your vision, and you just have to keep pushing it. I mean... We have a lot of difficulties in businesses, and a big portion of it is money, yes. But aside from money and other challenges business owners have, the one that you really have control over is yourself. Mm. And if you believe, I mean, notice the word I'm saying, if you believe it's impossible, you know what? It's going to be impossible. Yeah. If you believe that it can't be done, you know what? It's not going to get done. Mm-mm. So don't sabotage yourself. You know, start with the right mindset. Even if you don't believe it, say to yourself, I will make it. I will succeed. Mm -hmm. But don't just say it empty, you know, out into the air and and not follow through. As you're saying, I will do it, educate yourself. Surround Mm -hmm. yourself with pictures, with books. Talk to people that will keep you inspired and motivated, that will keep you on target, you know, focused on that vision. And as you constantly expose yourself or dose yourself like medicine, mm-hmm. the, the reality, I mean, the dream becomes a reality little by little. Mm. It's like, you know, swimming in that lake. You know, you're going through your struggles. You feel like giving up. But you know what? I see the boathouse. Mm-hmm. I, I see my success. But you know what? I feel like giving up and swallowing water and going down. Don't mm-hmm. do it. If you're swimming, you know, it's like an emergency. I mean, my flight instructor, and I'm sure a lot of good flight instructors out there, they'll say, Whatever happens in the airplane, keep flying the airplane. It's mm-hmm. aviate, navigate, communicate. And there was this one time, I'll, I'll just add this in. Mm-hmm. Um, I was already a private pilot, and I was flying in the mountainous areas of New York City. Uh, not New York City, yeah. Those would be the buildings of New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mountains in upstate New York. I took off from a, a, a non-towered airport, and as I'm climbing, the engine was getting rough. And... In my mind, I was like, oh, no, what's going on? Is this going to be my first uh, engine failure on takeoff in a mountainous area? And you know what? I, I couldn't believe it. I heard my instructor's voice literally in my head saying, keep flying the airplane. Keep flying the airplane. As long as I have power, keep that throttle in there. Keep flying the airplane. And while I'm maintaining control, I'm troubleshooting. I'm going through, you know, cigar tip you know, controls, instrument, gas, you know, going through my checklist, my mental, my flow, my emergency checklist all the way through the magnetos and everything troubleshooting. And uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but the thing was that I I, I took off on one magneto, one side of the magnetos. The thing was that I didn't have the uh, magnetos set on both. So evidently while I was doing my run up, I somehow missed putting the, uh, the key on both. Mm. So that's why the engine was running rough on takeoff, but I didn't panic. I didn't lose control. I had power. The plane was climbing. I kept flying the airplane. So with your business, keep flying the airplane. You mm-hmm. know, challenges will come up. Keep flying the airplane. Yeah, yeah. don't move throw forward. In the towel. Yeah. You know, keep going. Yeah, never throw in the towel. And you had mentioned prior, surround yourself with pictures and, and material and people. Don't surround yourself with negative people that are going to say you can't either. Get away from right. those negative people. Expel them. <laughs> Expel them. Love. I like that. <laughs> Expel them. You're fired. You're fired. <laughs> you know? Really, I mean, it, it's because it, it's the can't word. I mean, it's can't manifest it in a different way. Even if they don't say anything, their body language, their energy, I mean, you cannot be around people like that, and especially if you're a, a new business owner, an entrepreneur, a fledgling entrepreneur. And you're trying to grow your business. You cannot, because they're not in your bulk. They're not in your park. They're not in the same league as you're in. Mm-mm. I mean, you're not manifesting the money that you want to, but your mindset is not in the same park. You're mm-hmm. not even playing in the same schoolyard. You need to leave the premises, leave those people behind. <laughs> you know? I love that. <laughs> no, but it, it's very true. There's a lot of people I've uh, the past year since I started my business. I'm just not talking to. 
at all or very much. Um, and it's because, like you said, they're in a totally different mindset, ballpark. They're the nine to fivers going to work. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, going to a nine to five job and being happy with that. But they can't understand what it's like running a small business. And a lot of their thoughts or criticisms or even help will not be helpful because they've not in, they're not in the position. And uh, one mentor I was working with last year who was just giving me advice on my business on Twitter and such, uh, Debbie Burnt, was saying, well, you know, who's making money? Are your friends making a six-figure salary or am I? So I think I'd listen to me. I was like, good, good point, Deborah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not saying disown or banish these people. No. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying when it comes to business mm -hmm. and it comes to your idea, I mean, these may be well-intentioned people. I mean, your, your buddies, you know, guys you like to hang out with, go have pizza, or even your flying buddies, you know? I mean, you just, the thing is what I'm trying to say is if, if it's not conductive to your business, don't entertain it because you have enough struggles as a business owner as it is. You don't need help from your friends to make it worse for you, you know. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I completely agree. And, you know, you just, and like one person had said recently, I heard say, you know, if you're around, if you don't believe in yourself and you're in a place where I can't see it happening, just be around people who are making it happen so that you can see the final vision. So you might not be there yet, but hang out with people who are where you want to get to. Exactly. I agree with that. Yeah. No, so awesome, Brian. Well, you know, what advice would you have for someone who's interested in, in flying themselves? What would you tell an interested party, you know, thinking of learning to fly? Well, I can go on all day with this, but I know you have limited time. Yeah. <laughs> um, because uh, I love flying so much. It's something that I've always wanted to do since I was a child. But if you're considering flying, you know what I say is go ahead and do it. You know, don't say I can't because there goes the can't part because a lot of times people, you know, I, I've met people on the street and I talk to them and they say I'm a pilot. I fly these small airplanes. Mm -hmm. They go, oh, really? And they, they're really fascinated because for the most part, people think of aviation and airplanes. It's, you know, the airlines, you know, the large jet airplanes flying overhead, irrelevant to their life. Mm -hmm. But when you say, you know what, I fly my own airplane. I've flown to this state. I've flown to that place. I've flown here on my own pilot in command. It's like, wow, you really do that. And then, you know, the danger part does come up and I do address it in a responsible way. But you know what? There's lots of risks in life and flying is risky by nature, but it's not dangerous. What makes flying dangerous are the people. Mm. If you're a responsible person, you're disciplined, you stay on your game, you fly within your limitations. If you're a private pilot, only comfortable flying in visual conditions. Well, fly in visual conditions. There's nothing wrong with, you know, getting out of that. In fact, you should stay in that realm and not hurt yourself. If you are an instrument pilot and you say, well, you know what? I, I have a, an IFR ticket and I could fly down to 200 and a half in all kinds of funky weather. But you know what? I'm not comfortable if the ceiling's 2,000 feet high and the visibility is no less than five miles. Well, then you know what? If that's your comfort level, stick with it. You know, it, you have to exercise good judgment in flying and that's how you don't get killed. When somebody wants to fly, you know, I, I address those issues. I try to make it sound as obtainable as possible. It is. I know flying is very expensive, and it can be, but there's ways of getting to it. I mean, if you have a job and you have the will to do it, it's doable, you know. So what I say is before starting, I think the thing is to do your research. Subscribe to a magazine. Join AOPA, or if you don't want to join a society, Go to their websites because there's a lot of things online that are free that you could learn and educate yourself from. Join the forums. You know, I think an AOPA, the forum, I don't even think you need to even be a member. I'm not sure about that. But the point is I'm trying to make is expose yourself to these people. Uh, go to the FAA website. You know, find out what uh, meetings are happening in your area and, and sit in on some of the conversations. Expose yourself. Get a, get a grasp on it. Make, start making flying a reality and get comfortable with becoming a pilot. And you'll have a better vision and a clearer goal as to what to do. Now, that's the mindset part of wanting to be a pilot, but there's also the money part. I'm saying is this, is that I know the money is tough, so what I say is know how much is it going to cost in your area to train. I mean, the whole thing. I know the regs say 40 hours and you can become a pilot. Well, it's highly unlikely that you're going to become a pilot in 40 hours. The average is probably anywhere between 60 to 80, realistically. So let's just say 60 hours you become a pilot. Calculate how much it's going to cost. Start putting that money aside. And I would say if you're really eager to start, have at least half of it, at least half of that money put aside for it. Because one of the worst parts to becoming a pilot is stopping. Mm. 
you know, you fly 10 hours and then you stop and then six months later you pick it up. It's like starting all over again. Yeah, I can I mean, attest to You that. don't have, exactly, you don't have the experience to say, well, you know what, you know, like some pilots who have multi-engine ratings and instrument ratings and been flying for 20 years and if they stop flying for 10 years and they pick it up again, it's just like going up with an instructor two or three hours and they got it back again. I'm not talking about that. It's just because somebody who's starting to learn how to fly, you don't have the mind of a pilot yet and you don't want to stop the momentum in learning. No, if ideally, if you can have it all set aside at one shot and bang it out in three or four months, I think that's the best way, but I'm sure, I'm, I know there's a lot of people who can't do it. Mm -hmm. So what I say is, do your research, learn, know where you're going, draw a plan, find a good responsible flight school, and a way of doing that is by talking to other pilots. Find out the word on the street, say, this instructor is good, this examiner is good, this school is good. Oh, they've been around a long time. Their airplanes are well-maintained. Because mm. you want to set yourself up for a high success rate. Mm. And the unfortunate thing now that's going is pilot starts, but not pilot finishes. You mm. don't want to be a statistic. Yeah. Don't start, go halfway, even do solo cross countries, and then stop. That's a tragedy. Yes, I agree. You know? I totally agree. That that would be a very awful tragedy. And um, I, I had to do just that. I had to stop uh, for money purposes. But I didn't follow your advice and save up everything, as I probably should have. But uh, it's not impossible. It's on my realm. It will happen for me. Um, but I wanted to let everyone know if they want to go to AOPA, that's Alpha Oscar Papa Alpha org. They're a wonderful association. You can even get their magazine first six months for free. Uh, that's what I did, um, flight training. So you can learn a little bit about um, flight training and aviation from them. It's an awesome, awesome organization. You could also go to eaa.org. That's echo alpha alpha dot org. And EAA is the Experimental Aircraft Association. And they're the ones who put on Oshkosh every year. Mm, yes. you know, pilot heaven. So uh, <laughs> if you can visit those two major websites, yeah. that's a big start right there. Exactly. Exactly. And here's another thing to mention. A lot of people say, well, I'll get my license and then I won't ever be able to fly again because it's too expensive. Not true. Pilots love to fly. And a great many of them are normal, you know, people who have jobs, middle class people, and they hook up with each other. They all go out in groups and they all take turns flying and they share the cost of the gas and the rental of the plane. So there are ways to keep flying even after your license. If you really, really love it, it's not impossible. Yeah, so. it's, good that you, it's good that you bring that up because, uh, you know, once you get your pilot's license and say you don't have the funds to fly, there's a lot of flying clubs in your area where you can join and become a member and not really be flying. When I say flying like as a pilot in command, like you're actually shelling out the cash. I mean, you're, you're hanging out with these guys and gals, flying with them, and uh, let's say if they have a trip or a meetup or they want to go to a fly out, to a breakfast, to a lunch, a dinner, or go on a trip, you can contribute to the flight, so at least you're not shelling the entire burden, and it makes it easier for the pilot that you're flying with to get to point B or whatever mm -hmm. you want to go. Yeah. So, you know, just associate yourself. Don't say, oh, I got this expensive pilot's license, and now what? Mm -hmm. there's, there's many ways of trying to... Stay in it. Always. And if there's a will, there is a way. <laughs> and remember, never say can't because you always can. And that's your last words of advice, isn't it, Brian? Yeah. Just do it. To quote Nike, never give up, never surrender, and say I just and say I can and I will. I will. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for coming on today. And thank you. I must say an awesome big thank you for being a sponsor for Aviation Month on Savvy Central Radio. We are so blessed. Thank you very much. We have some phenomenal guests, including you, Brian. Uh, you are such an inspiration. Thank you so much for coming on today. Yes, um, you're welcome. And since you mentioned my sponsorship, it's, it's been a pleasure and is a current pleasure of sponsoring Savvy Central Radio and Aviation Month here in November. Listeners, for this month and next month, WinT is offering free shipping all the way through the holiday seasons, through Thanksgiving and Christmas, all the way to the New Year's if you visit www dot wind dot com that's whiskey india november delta tango echo echo dot com and order a wind tea you can get free shipping and also if you order three or more shirts this is kind of funny advertising for myself but if you order three or more shirts you'll get a free book by an amazing pilot his name is nathan Carricker. i'll ship that out his book this is his first book it's called a silver ring and uh, if you order three or more shirts with Winty, in addition to your free shipping, you will have his book sent over to you, to the address that you supply. Awesome. So uh, take advantage of that, folks. That is great. And I love his shirts, guys. Go check it out. Wind 
T W I N D T E E dot com. Please check it out. I love shirts. I have a bunch of them myself. I think I have like 27, but they are phenomenal designs. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> well, that's why I'm doing so well because you bought all my shirts. <laughs> that's it. Well, thank you for tuning into Savvy Central. And until next time, have a good day.